Hello, I'm Betty Swan. Welcome to our show, Wisdom in the Night, where you get help for those tough decisions in your life. Tonight, I have a great guest. He is a video game designer. Welcome, Jonathan Zungry. Hey. This is great to have somebody like you on. I can't wait to hear your story. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, people Very are nice. going to really enjoy listening to you. I just have a feeling about it. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, so uh, tell me a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, the, well, the reason why I'm in New York City is because my sister was a ballet dancer. And uh, what happened was she ended up winning a citywide competition when she was 15. And we always kind of knew that she was a pretty good dancer. But when she when won this competition, I remember thinking, like, oh, she was competing against 18 and 19-year-old girls who have been dancing, you know, their entire lives. And she ended up beating them. So we thought, oh, is Steph great? Is Steph great at ballet? I, I guess she is. So what happened was she got invited to be part of the School of American Ballet here in New York City. And, uh, and then what happened was when I went off to college, my parents uh, moved up to New York City to support her and kind of like live with her and be there with her. And then so anytime I got a break from college, I would come to New York City and kind of experience the city for the first time. And then after college, I moved here permanently. All right, so you grew up in Pittsburgh yeah. and you went to college in Pittsburgh? I went to undergrad in Pittsburgh at a school called Grove City College uh, in the outskirts, kind of the outskirts of Pittsburgh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it a big college? No, it was a very small college. Uh, kind of private school and uh, and and yeah and but the, the, the kind of the, one of the funny things about it is I, I always one of my dreams was always to go to NYU and during the summers I would take classes at NYU for filmmaking and make little short films and things like that and um, Part of my background is eventually I did get to go to NYU and get a master's degree there in game design, part of their very first class that they ever had in game design. Uh, what year was that? That was uh, 2012, so about uh, four or so years ago now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, after I graduated from that program, I, I taught there. So it was it was really wonderful. It was like because I, I would go to NYU and NYU is just such a magical school. If you if mm -hmm. you love education, mm -hmm. um, they have courses for everything. I remember flipping through their curriculum and they have like ancient Japanese history and then they have uh, uh, medieval uh, literature and like anything that you could possibly be interested in, there's a course for it at NYU. I mean, I taught a course on the history of video games. <laughs> is it really? How long, how long has that history been? When did it's that actually, start? Well, it's not, it's actually, I misspoke, it's not the history of video games, it's the history of all games. So we go back really far, even forever. to backgammon. Yeah, chess, backgammon. Uh, backgammon is, is 5,000 years old from Persia. So, yeah, and people still play it competitively today. Absolutely, yeah. I so, love to play backgammon. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so it's been it's just been a, it's been really wonderful, and that course is so much fun because it's a playable history of games. So what happens is uh, all the kids, all the students, get a lecture about a certain type or a genre of games. Let's say board games, uh, ancient board games, backgammon, chess, uh, Go, things like that. Uh, Mancala, that's an African board game where you sew the stones. And then what happens is they they uh, they go and and I basically uh, play the games with them. So they get they get a lab. You get paid for that. I get paid for that. That's a thing. That's a real thing. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, now, when you were a little kid, were you really into video games? Yes, I was. I always loved them. Um, I was the kid who went into a video game store, and I would look at every game. I would flip over the boxes back when video games came in boxes. Now you can download everything. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I would flip over every game and look at the back of the box and read every, every one. And you know what? When I still go into a, a game shop, I still, I still want to play every one. So I was mm -hmm. the kid who just, who just loved so did you have a giant stack of video games I in did. your house? I did. I did. As many as I could get my hands on. So how big was your collection? It was pretty good. Um, you know, especially as, as you got a little bit older. Um, my, my family, uh, I grew up, uh, actually, I, the first part of my life, uh, my parents were missionaries. So I kind of grew up a little bit in Amsterdam, Holland, uh, and then we were, they were in the Bahamas for a while. Um, and then we eventually kind of settled in Pittsburgh. But yeah, the Pittsburgh winters are really cold, <laughs> really mm -hmm. cold. Pittsburgh is a beautiful place. Like in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, the, the leaves get so green. It's kind of like a city that's built in, in, into the forest, into the side of the hill, mountains, oh, I didn't Appalachian know that. Mountains. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. But the winters are really cold, and all that green goes to brown. And it can get kind of sad, to be honest. And mm -hmm. so I would go, and I would go, get, go in this uh, basement and just play games, Legend of Zelda, and 
and uh, adventure games like King's Quest and just so many amazing ones. Did your parents ever worry because you spent so much time doing video games that they were concerned? I don't, you know, I heard it more from my Aunt Jean. <laughs> my Aunt Jean. <laughs> I, uh, I would go, and my mom worked, so during summers, uh, during school, I would go spend uh, the summers with my Aunt Jean, and my Aunt Jean would always say, that's going to rot your brain. She would say, he's going to turn your brain to mush, <laughs> you know? And I was like, I was, she'd say, go play outside, and so we'd go and play outside. It's, and uh, then as soon as you could, you came back to your games, didn't right, you? Right back to it, yeah. yeah. And actually, my, me and my cousin were so into it that we actually created a little review system for video games. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're like seven <laughs> years old, and <laughs> we're like creating a review system. So about, what was it? Uh, well, we reviewed video games and we also reviewed roller coasters because we really liked uh, amusement parks. Yeah. And I remember it being really funny because we would we started reviewing roller coasters and we found that we couldn't use the same criteria for reviewing a roller coaster as we could like a ride that spins around in circles. And we were really troubled. Here's like seven, eight year old us just being really troubled that our criteria is not universal. We should kind of have to come <laughs> up with different different categories to review the spinning rides, Andrew. You know that kind of stuff. But how so fun! Funny. Yeah. Seven years old to be thinking like. Yeah. That. You know, even that's a preview of where you were headed. Yeah, I guess because, so. Because uh, I've got a grandson, and he's been video games like, even, you know, parents worried that's all he wants to do, just what you're talking yeah. about. And to think that you could think, let's, let's uh, critique them, let's do this, yeah. let's do that. Yeah. Really amazing. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of it, too, is that video games have kind of a stigma attached to them that... Uh, they're for losers or they're for people who don't like to ever go outside or for people, right. you know, that kind of stuff. And, and when I was growing up, that, that was a big part of that. And I, I think there's, I think there's a little bit of shame that goes along with video games. Like if you really love video games you're, and, and you're an adult, you're not, it's kind of feels like you're not supposed to. The culture kind of says that you're not supposed to. I think it's changing a little bit. Well, but, well what would you say about a, a kid, say seven years old? Yeah up to 10, 12, yep. still just would prefer video games inside, yep. not interested in sports, interested in video games. Yep. Do you think it's okay? I think it is okay. I mean, I definitely think that there's something to a kid being exposed to a lot of things. I think that's one of my one of the things that my parents did really well is that uh, we traveled a lot. And so I went a lot of places and I saw, I saw a bunch of places in Europe and, and different countries. And I think it was one of the most fantastic decisions they ever made. So I think it's important to expose your kids to um, a lot of different types of things. But if the kid finds what they love, then it's the thing that they love. You know, and if that happens to be football, then great. If that happens to be uh, Overwatch or Grand Theft Auto or Super Mario Brothers, then that's what it is. And mm -hmm. and I think that that thing should be encouraged. You know, and I think that maybe perhaps start talking to them about, hey, what do you? If you love this so much, what what do you think you could possibly do? Would you want to be a video game journalist or a critic, like I was for a little bit? Would you want to be a video game developer, like like I am now? Um, those are things. Those are things that you can do. And they're sure. careers. They're careers. And you know what? If you're successful at it, they're really good careers, especially the development part. Well, so there's mothers watching this right yeah. now. Maybe they're single moms. Okay. And they they have to get let their kids be involved in all of this because they have things to do and it's too hard to stop, make your kids do this, do that, do this, do that. And yeah. as a mother, you tend to think, oh, I'll just leave them in there for three hours. I just got to have some time yeah. myself. What would you say to a mother about, she's concerned, is she ruining her kids? Yeah. Uh, what would you say? I think, I think I'm pretty okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that video games give kids things that they can't get from anywhere else, like a sense of agency and a sense of creativity. So if you oh, go, well, what was that first one, a sense of what? Agency. So what does that mean? Basically, it, it means that if your kid uh, is into a game like Minecraft, um, they can go in there and they can uh, build something that they own. So Minecraft is a game where it's kind of like Legos. Oh, it's I know what it is because I've, I've watched my grandson play right. it. Okay, right. Oh, so. my gosh, they love it. Oh, mm -hmm. they're, they're he so lived into on it, it. Yeah. forever and ever and ever. Now Everyone he's on to something else. But. Oh, is he on to something else? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, yeah, Minecraft is a huge, huge thing. But basically, when I played Minecraft, I built myself, you're supposed to build yourself a little house out of these mm -hmm. blocks. I know. And, and basically, I made a house for myself inside of a tree. So I made a tree house. I never, I never really had a tree house growing up, right? A real one. And uh -huh. I made one in Minecraft. And I like loved my tree house. And eventually it was like a little rinky dinky tree house and I put in some windows, I put in a little deck. Uh -huh. uh, I eventually put a ladder to the roof and, and a grill or like, uh -huh. you're not a grill, but like a workstation up there. Um, and and for, for a kid who's like six or seven years old, eight years old, 
it's hard for them to do that. <laughs> Where are you going to build a treehouse? You going to build one in Central Park? <laughs> you have to build one in Minecraft. Yeah. And he gets to do that, and then that's his. That's something that he owns. That's something that he built and he made, and that's important. And he can go back to it. Yeah. And look at it. Right. It's persistent. And he has friends. Right. And that they can, can come, look. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of my friends says this all the time. Video games are a way to give uh, people who are powerless a little bit of power. So kids, they don't have a lot of power. They don't have a lot of agency to make decisions for themselves. Inside a video game, it's the safe space, a safe place where they can make some decisions, a mess up, uh, do some things right, and learn from that. It's good. Uh, let me ask you this then. I've always wondered if because things move so fast in some of the games yeah. that I've watched him play, uh, do you think that kids are being trained to make quick decisions that in the video games it's life or death, you know? Yeah. And I don't think that's bad. I mean, why wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to train your mind to do, to think quickly, make a decision, and instantly see good or bad decision? For sure. You uh, do? Yes. Instant decision making and also, I think, uh, young children's exposure to things like Google uh, gives them the ability that I have had to learn. Because when I was young, we didn't, I, I didn't have Google. The internet was just kind of growing up. It wasn't a big thing. And so uh, the way that I kind of learned how to do things is ask people questions. Um, it was hard. I had to struggle through it. Nowadays, if you want to learn how to do something, you can Google it, and you can learn how to do almost anything. It's mm -hmm. crazy. That and YouTube. Yeah. That YouTube and you will teach you. YouTube too. tutorials. That's how I taught mm -hmm. myself how to program. Really? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's 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 a thing that you can do, and I think if kids can learn how to make quick decisions, um, oh, Google oh. things. There, there's this amazing video of these kids who are about five or six trying to use a Walkman, you know, a cassette player. Mm -hmm. You know, basically plug it in, play it, and uh, the way that they're going about trying to plug in and play this Walkman is the way that you scrum and search for knowledge on the internet, meaning they push buttons, they're like opening things, they're like being really rough with it, they're kind of like trying to break it, it almost seems, which is not the way that I was taught to do that. I was taught to be careful, read the instructions, right. press the button, but with something like Google and with something like the internet, just by that kind of reckless uh, searching and reckless investigating, you can learn things so quickly. And so I think video games with their uh, decision making, uh, Googling for kids, uh, some games you have you get a role like it's social where you have a team you have to you have mm -hmm. to do your role so it he's in you Australia how to work. right now his one friend's in uh, Germany one friend will be in America yeah. and then they have some others they just play I've forgotten what the latest ones is that they're playing some war game yeah 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 well let me ask you something in growing up with all of that and your parents being missionaries at one point uh, how did you get to know God yeah right well um, the best answer to that question is, um, first of all, I saw God through my parents. Um, they always did such a good job showing me that their faith and their relationship with God was not something that you just kind of did on Sunday. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a routine part of the deal. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't just ritual. It was relationship, and it was real. Um, I always laugh because we were we were routinely late for church. Sometimes we would be on time for church, and my dad would be like, "Hey, you guys want to get a donut?" And I'd be like, "Dad, we're on we're on time, man. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing good this week. Maybe we should get there." <laughs> and he'd be like, "Yeah, I want that double chocolate donut." So we'd go and get a donut, and then you'd be late. Yeah, and then we'd be late, and we have to like walk in the back and like <laughs> sneak in the back. But that was really good for me because it showed me that like, listen, this thing, this faith. This relationship you have with God, it extends beyond just the church walls. It's not, I mean, you, you should be on time totally for church. I totally agree. I <laughs> you know? totally agree. Yeah, so I saw it in my parents. I saw that their faith and their relationship with God informed every decision that they made. Mm -hmm. And it was such an intrinsic. They prayed about everything, I bet, didn't prayed, they? Prayed about any, everything. Always asked me what I felt. That's another thing my dad taught me to do and my mom is to teach me to think for myself. You know, read the Bible for yourself and, and get something out, of, out for yourself. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you relate to God? Mm -hmm. um, but the long, long story short is that I became a Christian through, uh, I went to a Christian school, and uh, there was a traveling group of entertainers that came to our, our school. I was a little kid, I must have been first grade, and they were these storytellers that would sing songs, and they basically told a one-to-one -one allegorical account of the gospel story. Fascinating. So it was a story about this kingdom that had all these children uh, that would always get invitations uh, to come to the castle of the king. 
Um, and uh, they, they never responded to any of them. They would fill up their mailbox. They never cared. They never cared to meet the king. You know, they would always go to the Carnival of Selfishness. <laughs> That's the name. <laughs> and I remember the song was like, it was real scary. It was, yeah. it was scary to be at the, the Carnival of Selfishness. But I remember one of the kids who, who the story is about eventually went to go visit the king, wanted to, wanted to seek it out, wanted to figure it out. And he met the king, and the king was this really nice guy who had these, and the first thing they did was the, the halls of the kingdom were these almost like sliding boards where you could run and you could like slip and slide down the halls. And, and he and the king did this and they're having a great time. And I was like, this sounds great. As a kid, you know, first grade kid, I was like, this sounds fantastic. Where I want to meet the king. Mm -hmm. And eventually they were like, hey, uh, the, the storytellers were like, uh, there is a real king and his name is Jesus and he also wants to meet you. And he ex is extending an invitation to you right now. So please stand up if you'd like to meet him. And I remember making a very clear-headed decision as a first grader being like, yeah, I totally want to meet the king. Are you kidding me? Like, I was like, I want to do this for sure. And I got up and I, and I said a, a prayer. And, and ever since that point, it gave me a really good impression of who Jesus is. The as, real Jesus. The real Jesus. As like a person who you can interact with, who wants to know you. It was, it was good. And have fun with. And have fun with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like so that slip and slide? The slip and slide down the halls of yeah, the castle. Yeah, yeah. There's know? been many a time I have laughed and laughed and laughed in my walk with Jesus. Yeah. Just, it's not all serious at all, is it? Yeah. It's just pleasant and uh, invades every part of your life in the best way, like good perfume. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's good. Well, now, so you got out. You got out of school. You yeah. came to New York with your folks. Yep. You are teaching at NYU. Yeah. Uh, what kind of challenges in all of this have you encountered? I yeah. know you had to have had struggles some way. It hasn't oh, yeah. all been great. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the big thing for me as a video game designer, as a game designer in general, is there's there's two main things, and one of them I already talked about, which was there's a there is a stigma that uh, it's not something that you should be doing, um, and I struggle with that. I mean, to be honest, when I first went to undergrad, and I I, I would have told my dad. Uh, I want to study video game design. It would have sounded like I want to study eating popcorn or like something, you know, can I study cotton candy for four years? Like something like that. Uh, but there wasn't even a program. There was no program in the United States. And now they're, they're everywhere because, you know, the times have changed. But there's that thing that you struggle with where you, you love this thing, but you don't feel like you have cultural permission to follow the thing that's in your heart. And it's very real. It's very real that, that, um, you don't see anybody doing it. You know that there are people doing it somewhere, but you don't know how to reach them. How do they do it? How does one break in, you know? And uh, I think the best thing for that is, one, uh, there's a couple of things that you can do for that. One is that you, you can learn how to program, because that is kind of a key that will open up doors for you. Go on Code Academy if you're starting out and you don't know how to program. Go on Code, Code Academy, learn some code, learn some JavaScript, learn some C++. That will open doors for you for sure. But another and thing And give is, you prestige, too, because you've got something, yeah. you've got something solid to yeah. say, but this is what I am doing. Can you do it? No. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, I am. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's definitely a thing on your resume that will get mm -hmm. you in the door. And, and I also think that just just to believe and play a bunch of games, you know, believe believe in the thing in, in inside your heart. It's not crazy. Mm -hmm. It's not a crazy thing. Don't you think that any time there's something brand new, the first thing that happens is everybody thinks it's crazy, weird, stupid, useless, and unimportant. Why do it? And there has to be those people that see it in their heart first, right? Yeah. And say. I don't care if people put me down for it. I'm still going to go for it. Oh, it's the truest thing in the world. The and how did you get yourself to do that? <sighs> I, I, you know, it's a good question. I just loved games. And I knew that if I was going to do something that I love, um, then that was, that it was, it was supposed to be the thing I love and the thing that I was afraid of. You know, and I, and I believe that those two things can be a compass for you in your what life. What was your biggest fear? Failure, you know, failing. Uh, even if I succeeded, I had all these conditions about my success too, where I wanted to make a certain type of game, and I think that was wrong-headed too. You know. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Because like, if you're making games, like if you're making any type of game, even if it's online games, if it's iPhone games, any type of game, educational games, that's a hard thing to do. And mm -hmm. if you're doing it, then then pat yourself on the back. But to be honest, I, I do think that. 
I do think that in, in regards to programming and in regards to, to, to game design, I think there's a lot of people that can do it. I think anyone can do it. I think you just got to have the grit and the determination mm -hmm. to do it. It's, it's hard. Programming, programming especially for me, is really hard because I'm a right brain kind of guy. I'm creative, and programming is left brain. That's logical. Mm -hmm. um, and it is my, this is a Lord of the Rings reference, but it is my Balrog. It's my demon. It's mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. In Lord of the Rings, Gandalf's not afraid of anything except for the Balrog. He's afraid of this ancient demon that he eventually has to confront. And yes, that's, I, I, I know that. Oh, you know it? Yes, Good. I oh, So we both yes, know I Lord did. of the Rings? Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's my Balrog. That's my code. It's like either you can do it or you can't. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's the thing I got to fight every day and keep on trying to get better at. And so for me, that, that was the big thing. That I had. There always is one thing when you're doing something big that you don't like and you don't think you're that good at it or you have to be good at it and you don't know if you measure up or not. Yeah. And that's a big challenge yeah. because you have to get good at it. That's, that's the problem. It's not like, well, I'm not good at it and so, hey, so what? No, it's like you're not going to be able to do it unless you are good at it, so get good at it. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I do. And a lot of those things that I think we say we're not good at, uh, sometimes when we when we put our mind to it, like my, we actually get good at it. My wife always said, I never want to be a salesperson. I never want to do sales. I'm not a salesperson. She ended up getting a sales job this past spring, and she is great at sales. She's like setting records and things like that. So Really? Yeah, I'm so proud of her, but she always said, I don't want to do sales. I never want to do sales. I'm not a salesperson. And then she got a sales job and just absolutely killed it, and I'm so proud of her. And I think that's a, 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 a true thing. Sometimes you think the thing you think is not for you is the thing that is for is you. Is for you. Definitely for yeah. you. Yeah, have you ever heard the saying, never say never, because yeah. that's going to be the thing you're going to do. Yeah. I'll never <laughs> live there, and that's where you're going to live. Yeah. I'll never do that. I try that's not to make you, those statements because well, I'm afraid. Well, don't, because every time I've made them, you know, yeah. it's kind of like God's going, he, he, he. Yeah. Well, guess what? You're going to yeah. do it, and you're going to love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, this, I, I know you're married, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, tell me about her. Oh, she's the best. She's, she's the best. I love her. Uh, her name's Sam, and she's from the Philippines. Uh, we met about eight years ago. And uh, dating her and marrying her was the best decision I ever made. She's the best. Um, like I said, she's super smart. She's super uh, talented. She succeeds at everything. She even things that she says that she can't. And marrying her and being uh, kind of exposed to Filipino culture was just one of the most fabulous things. You liked life. it, marrying somebody oh my, from another culture? Oh my gosh, it is the best decision. It's the best decision I made because I'm never, I'm never bored. I just, there's always something. The first time I met her, she said, uh, we're going to eat a meal, and here are the condiments. This is banana ketchup. And I said, Ban <laughs> banana ketchup? And she was like, yes, it's like ketchup that's made from bananas. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's have some. And then she said, for dessert, we're going to have cheese ice cream and avocado ice cream. And so we had cheese ice cream and avocado, which is, yes, yeah. Filipino ice cream that has cheese and avocado in it. And I ate it. It's fantastic. It is it's good. Great. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. All, all, the, all the meals that I've, had, uh, I've gotten to eat and all the different things that I've discovered about her culture, Oh, it's just so fascinating. So what in the world does banana ketchup look like and taste like? It is basically a kind of, if you could imagine, like an old Heinz ketchup bottle made of glass. But, yeah, it's ketchup that's made of bananas. It doesn't taste like uh, tomato ketchup. Oh, it doesn't? No, it doesn't. Um, it has its own unique taste, but it's good. It's and you use it for what? Um, you can put it on a lot of different things, but I... I, I always just I always feel like when I when I'm meeting with Sam's family and I'm discovering new things about her it feels like I'm reading Harry Potter because in, <laughs> in Harry Potter he is exposed to the world the magical world that's new to him like little bit by bit like he doesn't learn about some things until like the fourth book that are like mm -hmm. a bit like port keys that's a big part of the world but he doesn't learn about them and, and so like I am constantly learning about things about Filipino culture and Filipino history that I never knew about and mm -hmm. I learn and it's kind of like drip fed to me and I'm always like that's fascinating how come you never told me about that you know yeah so, so have you been to the Philippines and met all of her family I have do I, you fit in with them um I they accept me they're unbelievably kind and accepting and um and it, it, the philippines is just one of the most beautiful countries i've ever seen the, the beaches the beaches are a few steps up from coney island <laughs> <laughs> well i want to ask you for people watching there's a lot of immigrants watching this yeah. show probably a lot of filipinos what is your advice to a person who wants to marry somebody from a different culture a different ethnicity yeah. or just whatever, yeah. Yeah. and the parents are concerned. Yeah. What, yeah. Are, what, what advice would you give? Well, I think it's the best decision I ever made. So 
that's that's my perspective. I think that it is true that a lot of our conflict in our marriage will come from the fact that we do come from different cultures, you know, and that she has different expectations than I do uh, on certain things. Um, and but we know, we know now, we know that if we have a fight, it's probably because of that. One of the things, actually, it was really interesting when we got married. Um, my 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 groomsmen were going to take me out for a bachelor's party, you know, to get go to a steak restaurant. We're going to we went to this amazing steak restaurant that like, was like underground in the in the, this like grotto, and it was that was fantastic. But she, her perspective was um, a bunch of her family members were falling, flying in from the Philippines. And they were, um, you know, they basically wanted to see me before the wedding, but the only night they could have done it uh, was the night of my bachelor's party. And, because uh, we did it kind of the same weekend. And and that was a big conflict, because in the States, the bachelor party is like kind of a, it's kind of an important thing. Oh, for, it is, you know, absolutely. It's, it's, it's sacred. Yeah, it's sacred. absolutely. It's sacred. Uh, absolutely. But it's protected, like you're mm -hmm. supposed to have you're, one. Yes, you know? and if you and don't, what's wrong? What's wrong with you, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so. So that was a big conflict because in Filipino culture, um, you have to uh, live and be and, and, and meet, you have to meet the family, you have to meet the, the parents, mm -hmm. you have to pay well, your sure, respects. Sure, that is important. Yeah, so, so that was like a big conflict for us and thankfully we're, we kind of navigated through a lot of these different things and she let me have my bachelor party, which was amazing. Um, so in your marriage, uh, as you're navigating through just Regular marriage, you have regular struggles. I don't care how good your marriage yeah. is because you're two different yeah, people. Yeah, very true. Uh, and then you have this cultural thing yeah. that goes in. What kind of advice would you give somebody watching? What kind of wisdom yeah, from would, what you've gone through? I would say the best thing you can do is try to understand each other and try to understand the values that the other person has. So Sam is amazing with, um, with uh, my grandparents. Like uh, my grandpa, and before my grandma passed away, she was uh, by far the the best girlfriend I ever had in interacting with them. And I could tell, like, that's because she really respects uh, her elders and her family. And so the thing, so I I could see that as a value in her, and I love that about her. And um, so the best ex advice that I could give for an American um, who wants to get into a, a um, uh, a, a relationship with a person from another culture is to try to understand as much as you can and try to be respectful and, and understand why that other person's perspective and culture is valuable. Do your okay, best. Okay, that is great. Yeah. And so I want to talk to you all that are watching tonight. You have seen a person be so real in front of you about his dream for doing something that some people scorned and he just hung in there with it and you've heard him talk about marrying someone from another culture and how that's all worked out. So I want to tell you, your life matters and you can be whoever you want to be if you're willing to do the work to get there. And I thank you so much for tuning in tonight. It wasn't an accident that you turned on the TV. I hope you got some wisdom from this guy and I hope you have a great rest of the night. Whether you're going to sleep or you're going back to work. I'll see you next time. Bye.